Hey everyone, I'm Josh and I'm the Gatherings Director here at The River Church. And thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. And one easy way to do that is to text River Connect one word to 97,000. Or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. If you'd like to give to The River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Good morning, church. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Roy Townsend. I'm the Grow Pastor at The River Church, and I'm super excited to be able to to present God's word and to be with you. I know Pastor Chuck's away. He's suffering, (laughs) suffering. You know, I've been enjoying the pictures that that are posted. I hope hopefully you guys are too. But it is a privilege to be able to share God's word each and every time we get together. I'm thinking on Veterans Day, we don't want to take it for granted, the right that we have to gather together as the church and to hear the preaching of his word. There are many Christians throughout the world today who do not have that right. And so we're thankful for our rights. We're thankful uh, for our veterans. If you are new here or just catching up, we are continuing our study of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it's been an exciting time. We'll be finishing Matthew chapter 5. We've already written, I believe it's confirmed that we've already written Matthew chapter 6 for next fall, and we are beginning to write Matthew chapter 7 for the fall after that. So some have asked me, like, you know, why would we take such a serious look at the Sermon on the Mount? The biblical message of Jesus Christ, the biblical message of God's Word, if it does not penetrate our lives, we're in trouble. And we can see from a study of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is coming to correct. I mean, this was God's chosen people. They preserved the message. And Jesus has to come and correct that view because they missed it. They weren't weren't telling the whole truth. We can see this. His disciples, they missed it. His, his followers, they missed it sometimes. And I, I want to be honest. I've been in the American church, right, my whole life. We have missed it sometimes. We've missed it too. And so we want to make sure as a church body that we are committed to the study of his word. It's what makes us different. That we have God's complete word and we want to study it. And we want to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to further reveal to us from this teaching, because it's easy sometimes to miss it. So I want to begin with a word of prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to be invited in to help us as we start to break apart this scripture. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you today. I'm thankful, thankful for the ability to gather, thankful for your word, Lord. How many believers went through their lives without having your word? We're thankful, Lord. How many believers went through their lives without having your word in their language? Lord, we're just thankful that we have these opportunities to study and to be together and gather together. Lord, we pray for the Holy Spirit's direction today. Lord, I pray that I would be out of the way as the scriptures are broken back, explained. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll be reading from Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 33. The title of the section is On Oaths. So I know some people are like, Phew. you know, after anger and adultery and divorce, I told uh, Kyle, I got the good one. <laughs> so, oaths. It says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, and do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes 
or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. And so a cursory glance of this section of Scripture, we see that many times people, when they're studying, they miss it. And I I think of reasons why we miss something, right? Sometimes it's because we're reading it in, in English and we think we know what the English words mean because this is what the English words mean today. Like the other day when I was, you know, eating a dessert with a friend of mine and young, young, young person, I guess I should say, and they go, man, this dessert is sick. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's really good. I mean, it tastes great, you know, but uh, it's, it's not making me sick, right? You know, or, you know, and you say, oh, what do you mean? I'm like, you know, I'll admit it. I'm not that much older than this person, but I don't use the word sick in that way, okay? We miss it sometimes because we feel like we know it. A buddy of mine, I'm almost embarrassed to tell this quick story, but a buddy of mine has a Ford Bronco from the 1980s. It's painted camouflage. It has two 18-foot antennas attached to it. Anywhere I see him, I know this is my friend, right? I see him. And so I'm driving home from church the other day, and I look over from the church building that I was work at, and I was looking over, and I'm, oh, he's pulling out of the gas station, you know? So the next time I run into him, you know, it's at the gas station at the corner of Dixie Highway and Williams Lake Road. And I'm like, man, I saw you pulling out of the, the mobile gas station the other day. And, you know, he lets it go, and he's just like, uh, I only get shell gas. Oh, that's weird. Well, why were you pulling out of the mobile gas station at the corner of Dixie Highway and Williams Lake Road? He goes, well, I I was pulling out of the gas station. And I go, well, you you say you only buy Shell gas. I'm I'm having trouble following. And he's like, hey, bud, not to make you feel dumb, but um, that's a Shell gas station. (laughs) Well, I've lived there my whole life. And for 40 years before, it was a mobile gas station. People might say, what do you mean? I drive by this gas station at least two times a day. Two times a day. At least two times a day. And I go, well, how long has it been a a Shell gas station? Ten years. (laughs) Ten years. I have driven by this gas station for ten years. Twice a day on Sundays Four times, okay? And I know it as a mobile gas station. Now, it's, they're really tricky. They didn't change anything but the sign. Like, nothing has changed in this gas station. But it was interesting to me. Listen, I wasn't trying to miss it, but I missed it. Sometimes when God and Jesus, when he came and he's teaching and he's preaching and he's, he's breaking apart the scriptures and calling us to a better way of living, We miss it sometimes on purpose. I've shared this before, you know, when my dad used to ask me to take out the trash, it was how far could I get it out of the trash can toward the other trash can, but I didn't want to take it all the way outside because I didn't want to put my shoes on, right? And mom would yell at us if we walked out in our sock feet, right? You know, so it was like one of those things, like, well, if I put it right in front of the door, He'll have to pick it up to walk inside the house. He'll have to pick it up and put it in the trash can. So I'm like, did I miss what he wanted me to do? Or did I just want to do something else? Did I miss it because I knew what it was? For 40 years, it was a mobile gas station. There's no question. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to confess. I left church that day and drove to that gas station fully intending to prove him wrong. He, I don't know what he's been doing. There ain't no way that is a Shell gas station, right? And I get there, and it couldn't be bigger than life, right? Sometimes we miss it because of the language. We might not understand. One point in my career, I worked with a lot of international students. And you say, well, big deal. Well, international students, they're here to study the language, right? They're here to understand the language. And they would ask me very meaningful questions and very deep questions questions about our language and they were trying to understand you know and I go oh you know that that over there it's at the corner of Dexter and Shimmons Road and they're like Dexter I go yeah 
They're like, why, why would you name a road Dexter? Because it's somebody's name? I mean, that, you know, Shimon's Road, that was the people that owned the farm. Dexter was somebody's name. You know, usually names, the road names are numbers, the city it leads to, or somebody's last name. They're like, well, why would somebody's name be Dexter? And I'm like, apparently, I don't understand what the English language means. And I said, well, what does Dexter mean? And they go, it means evil. It means sinister. It means left-handed, which tells you what we thought about left-handed people back in the day, right? <laughs> evil, sinister, left-handed. I'm like, I've missed it. And they're like, well, you know, and then I'm like, oh. There's a TV show about a killer. They called it Dexter. Apparently the people that wrote the TV show are smarter than we are, right? I just thought that was somebody's name. Or, or this you know, lady comes to me and goes, oh, this is my brand new baby. I named it Mara. Isn't Mara beautiful? Oh, Mara is beautiful, right? But Mara means bitter. Right, you know, I know that one from the Bible, right, from Scripture. So sometimes we are missing the message because we don't want to know. Sometimes we're missing the message because we feel like we understand it. Other times we're missing the message because our, our language has changed, how we use some words. I thought of idioms. It was really funny for the international kids. They'd come, you know, what does saved by the bell mean? You know, what does dead ringer mean? I'm like, oh, you know, dead ringer means somebody that looks just like you. Well, when I look it up, that's not what dead ringer means. Oh, okay. Well, saved by the bell. You know, a lot of times, you know, think people think of school and, you know, the teacher's mad at you and the bell rings and you're saved by the bell or a boxing match and you're getting ready to lose and time is up and they ring the bell. And they're like, yeah, I looked it up. It, that's not what it means. So I, I became curious. I'm like, oh, what, what does it mean, you know? Well, apparently dead ringer and saved by the bell is because before we used to embalm bodies, we weren't 100% sure they were dead. So they would tie a string to their toe or to their hand, bury them, and they would leave the string and they would hang a bell. And if you woke up and you were, happened to be in your grave, and you would move frantically and it would ring a bell. Saved by the bell dead ringer. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not what it means today, right? You just got to, you know, you just, you're studying the language too hard. You're missing the point of how it's used. Well, Jesus here at the Sermon on the Mount, he is clarifying the point of his message. Jesus is saying that he deals not only with the actions of anger that leads to murder and lust that leads to adultery and selfishness sometimes that leads to divorce. And now, He's talking about oaths. It seems like a very strange progression, but it will make sense to us. One commentator wrote, Jesus explained that sin came from the attitudes of the heart. Anger is murder in your heart. Lust is adultery in your heart. Pastor Chuck taught that, you know, we, as, as people, we think murder is when somebody actually takes somebody else's life. And by definition, it is. But Jesus is correcting that. He goes, no, the anger of murder in your heart was where that started. We would define adultery as, you know, a spouse having a sexual relationship with somebody other than their spouse. And we think it's when it actually happens. And they're like, no, that lust in your heart. Jesus says, that's where it's starting. As Kyle taught last week, the hardness of our heart makes it very difficult you know, because people are like, oh, what, what's going on? I know Kyle mentioned this. You know, with divorce, the culture had taken the words of Scripture and twisted them so quickly to mean that you could divorce somebody because you didn't like the meal that was served. Seems like a very frivolous divorce. So Jesus backs it up. Pastor Chuck reminded us, like, hey, this is where it starts. Interesting, the progression we mess it up. So today is oaths. I've had a few people like, you're doing a whole Sunday on oaths. It doesn't make sense to me. So let's reread Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. 
It says again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than that, than this, comes from evil. Now, I've had a few people, as we were writing the lessons, look at this and like, hey, Roy, uh, you, know, you missed it. It's like that gas station. You missed it. That actually sounds like the Bible. If you take an oath to the Lord, you should perform it. You should make sure you make it happen. Some of you are sitting back just like the Jews were at this time. The Jewish leaders, when they wrote these rules, you're like, hey, finally, this is a good one. You know, anger and lust and, and selfishness, but oaths. It's amazing to me how quickly their culture took oaths that were silly and frivolous oaths because they knew the Scripture taught to tell the truth was correct. You say, oh, wait a second, oaths, that's about speaking the truth. People would take an oath because they didn't want to, they wanted to make sure that you would connote that I'm telling the truth. But if I took an oath over here and tricked you into believing that I took a real oath, then it was okay to lie. The culture had taken God's chosen people, the people who preserve the scripture. And I know some people are like, hey, Roy, this, this is not part of our culture anymore. Really? I'm going to give you a few phrases that I think people say when they're speaking. Let's look at our everyday language and realize that people still today swear they are telling the truth by saying, God help me. God help me if I'm not telling the truth. Some of you say, oh, I don't know that I hear that a lot. I swear to God. I swear to God that's what happened. I hear that all the time, all the time. Uh, God is my witness. My family's from Kentucky, so they use the word by God, like every sentence. You know, the la, 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 I saw George down there by the telephone. By God. Uh, hey. It's not a big deal. George was by the telephone pole. We don't need to invoke the name of God Almighty that you're telling me the truth that he was standing by the telephone pole. Right? It's not a big deal. Why are we doing that? Because people, God is my witness. Oh, one of my favorites. Hold my hand to God. Hold my hand to God. This is what happened. Oh, so now we're, we're adding gestures to the oaths. In the things that people say. Sometimes people trying to tell me that they're telling the truth, they, they say they swear to God, but they add a curse word before God. Absolutely. Happens frequently. If people don't, you know, it's one of those things I hate when they say, what do you do for a living? Because then you got to tell them. So then everything's going to be fake once they find out I'm a pastor. Right? Prior to that, I was hearing, I swear to God. And it gives me an opportunity to know where they're at so that I can try to speak truth into their lives. The Lord knows. We even find here in the scripture, sometimes we think taking oaths are romantic, right? I think of all the, you know, love songs, you know. I swear by the moon and the stars above. I swear. Right? <laughs> right? Oh, wait, wait. Uh, we're going to take it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's how much I love you, baby. That's how much I love you. By the moon and the stars above. I look into those eyes, right? Right? We use this in our language. I was going to tell you it's the God's honest truth that we use this in our language. But I thought that might confuse some of you. The scripture says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We can't miss it. If you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. You don't need to take an oath. You don't need to live a life that's so deluded that people need you to take an oath to know if you're telling the truth. 
And people say, oh, you know, oh, come on, Roy. And I started thinking, man, with kids, most of my career has been spent with kids. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I'm telling the truth. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Where did we come up with this stuff? Where did we come up with this? I was a little sick. The proper use of the word sick. That they're sticking needles in their eye to prove that they're telling the truth. Believe it or not, that actually comes, people, when they say cross my heart, that's what they mean, the cross. It was actually started as a religious oath. It's only been the last hundred years. The first recorded instance of cross my heart and hope to die was in 1908. So we are still doing the same thing that Jesus came 2,000 years ago to correct. Kids say this. They point. There's utterances. You know, I started thinking, oh, man, when kids telling me a story, I even kind of giggle sometimes and go, why do you got your hands behind your back? Because my fingers are crossed. That means I get to tell a lie. Right? That is actually the sign of the cross. This is what people, how it was originally intended, that crossing of the fingers. It is taking a religious oath, and now we feel like we've made it just a kiddie little juvenile thing. Cross my heart, my fingers crossed. Oh, I hope that happens for you. Right? We all understand it. We all understand it. This is, we are taking silly things. I hope that happens for you. I hope you get a banana split. The sign of the cross for you to get a banana split. It's foolish. It's foolish. Or because I use the sign of the cross, I can now lie. It's foolish. It's contrary to the scriptures. We all know this. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Pretty famous verse here that I'll quote from. It says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of how we talk. It's a part of how we try to put that, I swear, that solemn on something that's frivolous. We are taking the Lord's name in vain. We usually think of this verse to take the Lord's name in cursing. This verse condemns the man who swears that something is true or who makes some promise in the name of God who has taken the oath falsely. That's Exodus. How about Leviticus? Let's just go Leviticus 19:12. You shall not swear by the name by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. If a man Numbers chapter 30 verse 2, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So what happened is the religious leaders at this time twisted the scripture to try to make it something that they could attain. So even though it was about murder in your heart, which is anger, let's define it to be just the actual taking of someone's life is when I did wrong. So anything I do short of actually taking someone's life, which I would assume most of us don't struggle with, actually taking someone's life, oh, check the box, I feel good about that one. Give me the star, give me the Sunday school sticker, whatever it is, right? Give me the A plus on the assignment. Oh, adultery, oh, I never do that. I would never actually physically do that with somebody but if I think about that and I do that and I fantasize about that and I desire that and I watch that it's just the same as doing it the vow the oath that we're talking about here interesting that he talks about this after we most of us who are married have taken an oath a covenant to our spouse most of us had that done before a preacher. And you took a vow before God and an audience. As a matter of fact, I think the preacher usually says that. You took an oath, took a vow, solemnly swore. 
Even in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20, it says, You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name, you shall swear. So when it becomes necessary. So we can see consistently in the Old Testament, this concept is taught. If you take an oath and you invoke the name of God, it needs to be done. And when things are solemn, like a marriage, we need to tell everybody the whole truth. We took a vow. But many times people are taking vows on useless things. Things that aren't necessary, things that aren't proper. Again, who cares who's standing by the pole downtown? You don't need to invoke the name of God. Right? If I'm teaching from the scriptures, I shouldn't have to solemnly swear that I'm reading for you the scriptures because they're on the screen. You have the scriptures in front of you. I should make sure there is a reason behind it. And we see this a lot in our culture. It's almost part of how we talk. We invoke the name of God in things that are irreverent and meaningless. Some of us even take the swearing, to, uh, the swearing an oath to uh, another step. I frequently hear the name of God taken. Whether they're calling for damnation, God asking God to damn somebody, I hear it. Or just when something bad happens and you invoke the name of Jesus Christ, it's everyday language. And we have to be careful. We know that the scriptures are reminding us. We know that Jesus Christ stepped out here and he taught us. But there's also this evasive swearing. Well, hey, if I, how many times do you think I swear by the moon and the stars above have been said to get something that they didn't need? I mean, I remember being 16 at the fairground, right? Getting my driver's license. I mean, let's be real. I probably would say anything I needed to swear, on, swear upon to get this person to go out with me or to do these things with me. I don't think that has changed. I don't think that's changed no matter what age you are. If you find yourself in that situation where you're seeking that, many people take oaths. They swear and we have a love that's going to last, right? Almost every, I call it the Hallmark gospel, right? Don't get me wrong, I like a good Hallmark every now and then. But mm, follow your heart. No, don't follow your heart. The scripture says your heart is sick. Sorry to bring that word back up. <laughs> and sick means bad, desperately wicked. Who can know it? We have a whole four stations dedicated to follow your heart. Scriptures are telling us to be careful. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 21 and 22, it says, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. So even in the Old Testament, the scriptures clearly tell the Jewish people, listen, if you say and invoke God, you're going to be held accountable to it, even if it's held accountable by God himself. Don't do it. It's sin. Some people say, okay, Roy, okay, okay. So the Old Testament said this. But it seems pretty clear that Jesus is telling us not to take an oath. Did they miss it? Did we miss it? And I tell people, the Jewish people at this time, the leaders had messed it up. They twisted it. They screwed it up. You say, what do you mean? Even from Matthew chapter 5, every time Jesus corrects something, he says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old. Why does he say that? It's said to those of old. The Jewish people at this time could not read their own scriptures. And some people go, oh, that's, that's terrible. They couldn't read their own scriptures? The English people couldn't read their own scriptures until 500 years ago. Four to 500 years ago. 
Did the English people exist before that time? Yes. The Jewish people, again, when they become a country after World War II, absolutely cannot speak Hebrew. When they started their own country, they wanted Hebrew to be their language, but Jewish people didn't speak Hebrew. Only religious leaders knew how to speak Hebrew. So when you have it pocketed like that, it can be twisted. And they keep reading this and say, oh, listen, isn't it clear from the Old Testament that that God did not want us to, to take an oath before him and misuse it? So they became so vigilant about this that you had to start taking an oath because they were so cynical that you were actually telling the truth. And then there's a whole ancient sect of, sect of Judaism that says you can't compliment a bride on her wedding day because you're probably lying about something. Interesting. Interesting that they would take it that far because they wanted to say, look at me, we are the man, we are the woman, we are the Jews, we are the chosen people. We can obey his standards when we invoke an oath in the Lord's name, in God's name, we're his chosen people. And so they create these 600 plus laws that make them look good. It's real easy to kick them, right? Don't we do the same thing? Let's be real, guys. How many of you put ugly pictures on social media? I don't open up my camera roll, look for the worst picture, and post it. Do I? When my kids are bad, do I take a picture and post, hey, had a great day today, my kids were bad. Fighting with my wife today. Yeah, great day. Praise the Lord. That's not what we post. We post what makes us look good. Every once in a while, people say, oh, no, that's my friends. They talk about their feelings. Yeah, we talk about our feelings so other people will show concern. Well, I think that goes back sometimes to selfishness. Is it an appropriate place for people to show concern? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I know there's people that when I read it sometimes I go, "Ah, this is hard for me to judge. Is this an appropriate thing or is this feeding into the wrong thing? Just like I do with my children. They want to go out. I want to go to this movie on Friday night. Who's going to be there? Is this an appropriate thing? Is this a wrong thing, right? We have to think about it. We have to apply it. So Jesus is calling us in the Sermon on the Mount that we have to be careful. Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 16 and 17 says, And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people, to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be built up in the midst of my people. But if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly pluck it, pluck it up, And destroy it, declares the Lord. I think it's pretty clear that when we were taking solemn oaths, the teaching in the Old Testament is to take a solemn oath and to take it and use the Lord. The closest I see to this is our marriage ceremonies today. But then we have people say they read it, and it's, that's why I mentioned the language evolved, and they read this, and they say, oh, this is a false friend. I know people that will not sign a marriage contract because of Matthew chapter 5. I know people who will not testify in court, right? You ever wonder that? I mean, I don't know if any of you, I like court dramas. I'm kind of weird like that, you know. Raise your right hand, put your hand on the Bible. I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Right? Why is that? So help me God. Because we live in a broken world and people lie all the time. I always thought it was interesting. Tell the truth, that should have been enough. Tell the whole truth, okay, that should have been enough. And nothing but the truth. That should have been enough. So help me God. Raise your right hand. Put your other hand on a Bible. That's to the degree that we have to take it 
to try to make somebody think that they're actually going to tell the truth in a court of law. We have pastors that are standing up across America today and say, you know what, this Old Testament, it's real inconvenient to try to explain. So we're going to exclude it from what we teach. We have God's complete word, guys. We study both the Old and the New Testaments. We try to apply it. We pray that the Holy Spirit directs us to an understanding of it. And through the study of it, we grow deeper and deeper. People are like, okay, other than, other than marriage, other than, you know, court of law, what are you talking about, Roy? I was a school teacher for many years. Some people, this is going to blow their mind. Even today, a teacher, when they get a certificate in the state of Michigan, I looked it up to make sure that it's still the law. I'm supposed to raise my hand before a notary and a witness and say these words, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the State of Michigan, and I will faithfully discharge my duties to that office as a teacher to the best of my ability. Before a notary, it gets notarized. I have to raise my hand to say these things, and then the superintendent of schools is supposed to keep my notarized copy as leverage to put me in jail if I break that oath. This is today. Interesting. We think, hmm. now some of you are like, hey, oops, Roy, you messed up. I read Matthew chapter 5. You shouldn't have raised your hand. You shouldn't have said those things. Oops. When Jesus says, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, many people, that's it. I understand those words. I understand those words. Quakers, Amish, Mennonites, Dunkards, Anabaptists, I can name lots of denominations that as part of this, they can't say the Pledge of Allegiance. As part of this, they can't, they question a lot. We have to be careful when we read the scripture, just like we can't miss it, like me driving by the gas station. We can't miss it like my international students informing me what dead ringer means and informing me what the word dexter means. The Apostle Paul, so we're going to look at some New Testament situations here. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, says, But I call God to witness against me. Okay, now wait a second. That sounds like an oath. I call God to witness against me that it was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. He is invoking God as his witness. To the church of the Galatians in chapter 1, verse 20, Galatians 1, 20, it says, In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. In his letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Romans chapter 9, verse 1, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. I mean, he, he's invoking Christ and the Holy Spirit on that last one. This is after Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. So my friends who read the Scripture and say, oh, that's what it means. We can't sign a marriage contract. no. That's what it means. We can't testify in court. No. You're removing that statement from the context of what Jesus was trying to say. The first thing he's saying is don't take frivolous oaths. When you take an oath, it should be solemn. So if you're at court, you can take the oath. If you're going to be a police officer, a first responder, in our military... You can take the oath. When you marry, you should take an oath. 
honestly, when those of you who've witnessed marriage ceremonies, that language is you are solemnly swearing that these two people came freely to be married. That concept is written in there. So we know that the Apostle Paul clearly uses Christ, God, the Holy Spirit as witness before them, in them, as a means to clearly state that he is telling the truth. The author of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 16, it says, For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So again, we don't want to miss it. Some people jump and say, oh, he's just saying never take an oath. No. He's calling us to a radical truthfulness. When I take an oath in court that I'm going to tell the whole truth, I'm not going to be like I am on my social media. Do I tell the whole truth on my social media? I mean, I guess if I say this is how my whole day goes, there's a lot of things I don't put up. I only put up good things. I only put up things that make me happy. I only put up things that I think make other people happy. But by doing that, it makes other people sad. Because it's not a radical truthfulness. It's a presentation, putting my best foot forward. Matthew chapter 26, verse 63. I want us to look at this for a second. Even Jesus Christ himself was put under oath. It says, But Jesus remained silent as the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus did not balk at the high priest putting him under oath. Tell us the truth by the living God as you stand here Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? Christ did not push back when the the high priest invoked the living God. You've heard it said of old, again, because they couldn't read. Rabbis were the ones who read and interpreted the word of God. Now the Son of God says, but I say to you. James chapter 5, verse 12 says, Above all. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. What is it saying? We need to tell the whole truth. Do you really mean the whole truth, Roy? A lot of the guys are looking at me. Well, do you really mean the whole truth? Do you tell the whole truth, Roy, when you interact with people? I try my best to speak the truth in love. You know, one of my buddies was laughing the other day. A young adult was sitting there, brought their their new live-in girlfriend. We're getting a house together. Would you pray for us? Oh, yeah, I'll be praying. I'm going to be praying because you know the truth. You know that you shouldn't be moving into a house with somebody until you're married if you're going to be in a sexual relationship with that person. They know the truth. Yes, I'll be praying that the truth of his word convicts you as you try to push this along, contrary to the teaching of the scriptures. I will pray. You telling me you're going to purposely do wrong makes me want to pray for you even more. We can't hide. Did you know that God told the Israelites to erase whole peoples from the planet? Yes. In today's world, we call that mass murder. In today's world, we we hang people for that, shoot them, drug inject them to death for a genocide against a people if we can get to them. It's difficult to understand. It's difficult that it's in the scriptures. But I can't hide from the whole truth. I can't just say, oh, I'm just going to teach you guys the New Testament. New Testament doesn't have any genocide. Huh? Really? A buddy of mine pulled up a church in the area. They had a Sunday morning gathering. There was no mention of his word. There were lots of nice things they had on the screen. Lots of nice things they talked about. They seemed like really nice people. 
the truth of God's word tells us that we are condemned already to hell. And if we don't believe in the name of Jesus Christ, there is a consequence. We have to teach and preach the truth. Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37, it says, You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. We know what the intention is of Jesus Christ as the Sermon on the Mount is being. He is going after this weird twisting of the scriptures where people are purposely trying to mislead. I mean, I found it funny. And he's like, don't swear by your beard. I, I, apparently we have missed that one. I do not understand, like, what, you know. But other, other ones that maybe some of us would have heard or we understand differently. I swear on my mother's grave. I hear that one a lot. I swear on my mother's grave that, grave that this is the truth. I swear on my children's grave that this is the truth. One guy trying to be funny said he swore on his mother-in-law's grave. I was like, huh, I'll give you that one. That was a little funny, inappropriate, but a little funny. We know that this happens, and how frequently do we get ourselves caught up in this? The scripture is telling us what comes out of our heart. The Sermon on the Mount is telling us what comes out of your heart. Jesus Christ is calling us through a relationship with him and the power of the Holy Spirit, that what comes out of our heart, the abundance of our heart, will be what is good, will be, excuse me, will be what is good, what is kind, what is pure. Out of that relationship with Jesus Christ, we need to tell the whole truth. We need to be radical truth givers. We don't want to miss it, and if we're being truthful to others, we don't want them to miss it. But it's easy to not give the whole truth. I think of when a non-believer and I are talking, sometimes it's like, do I know him well enough that I can share the whole truth? When people that I know don't believe are saying, oh, I'm, I'm praying for you. Well, who are you praying to? Because you don't believe. Oh, Roy, you're that offensive? Eh, no. I'm trying to tell you where I struggle, how to work that conversation, how to have enough relationship to speak the truth in love, to correct that idea, because I don't know when the Holy Spirit is going to come knocking. I don't know when they're going to get the ability to feel the Holy Spirit calling them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, For he says to them, In a favorable time I listen to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. There are some that are hearing this online. There are some that are listening to this after the fact. There are some here today. We don't want to miss it, and we want to give the whole truth. To the non-believer, the scripture teaches clearly today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. A genuine repentance and a genuine faith go hand in hand, turning away from our sins and turning toward God. John 16, 8 says, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That's New Testament for those of you and that only follow the New Testament. It's a gospel. And it says, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That's a difficult message. 
And when the Holy Spirit is moving in somebody, they have the ability to hear that. They hear the warning. But we also know that you can quench the Holy Spirit. Some, I know, have repeatedly and repeatedly pushed off, quenched, turned off their ears, closed their hearts, hardened their hearts, whatever picture you need to understand it. We know that people have pushed off the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 3 Verses 7 and 8 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As in rebellion, it's in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. We have to be careful. For those of you that don't know Jesus Christ, we want to share the whole truth with you. There is a judgment for what is good, and there's a judgment for what is wrong. The scriptures clearly tell us that we are already condemned, but Jesus Christ came to save the world, not to condemn the world, but that through him you might be saved. And the Holy Spirit is knocking at the door. The Holy Spirit is speaking in your ear. The Holy Spirit is softening your heart. Whatever it may be for you to best understand it, do not quench it. Do not push it away because today is the day of salvation for the church for those of you who already know Jesus Christ as Savior the world needs radical truth givers not these guys who are mouthpieces not these guys that are just trying to alienate and be mean to people but share the truth in true love I used to talk to teachers about this all the time. You know, teachers, I don't understand why my class hates me. Well, it's the way you talk to them. When a kid's late, I can look at them and go, you're late. See me after class, dirtbag, right? <laughs> or I can go, ah, missed you. We need to connect after class. You say, oh, come on, does that work? Absolutely it works. All I need them to know is I know that they were late and that we need to follow up with it. I can say it in a way that doesn't demean, humiliate, or push them away. It doesn't mean I don't hold them accountable. Some teachers, oh, you make me sick, all that language. I'm like, as believers, we're called to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. So for the church, the world needs radical truth givers, radical truthfulness, even when it is difficult. Above all, brothers, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. Would you please stand with me? We'll close in prayer. Lord, we love you. And again, Lord, I pray for those here today who don't know you. May we speak the truth in love, Lord. May we be burdened, Lord. May we be right in relationship with you and follow the direction of the Holy Spirit to tell others of this radical truth, but also of this radical love that you came and you died because we were condemned already. And that through your death, we can have life eternal with you. Lord, for the believer in the room, let us take seriously, Lord, our words. Let us take seriously these things in our lives where we are flippant about our oaths, where we're flippant about not following through on what we say we're going to do, or, Lord, where we are purposely misleading others. Help us to be truthful, Lord. Help us to seek out those that we have offended and hurt. The scripture tells us to examine ourselves. Help us to go after that, Lord. Examine ourselves and see whom we have hurt, Lord, and seek forgiveness. Lord, let the Holy Spirit work in our lives and allow us to be committed to being these radical truth givers to a dying world. 
It should change the way we think. It should change the way we act. Lord, help us to submit to that. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.